The risk to all of us in the market lately is vast. One of the most prevalent risks that the top investors are looking at is the global de-dollarization around the world. What's an investor to do and how can we mitigate this risk? Well, my next guest is a gold mining expert that has over $600 million under his belt, and he's about to teach you and I key price points to look out for in your pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Jonathan Ott. Jonathan is the president and CEO of Dakota Gold, a publicly traded South Dakota-based responsible gold exploration and development company that he started with precious metals mining titan, Robert Quartermain. He has over 15 years experience in gold exploration and development, and he's raised over $600 million for all his various investment opportunities in the gold industry during that period. So what does this mean? Well, this means that John is changing the game in gold exploration, and he's about to teach you the things that he looks for when investing in this sector. So, John, welcome to the show, man. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a huge fan and uh, go Oilers. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we're hoping for the cup. I love it, man. Uh, another fellow Canadian. It's really great to have you here. I know mining and energy and all these things are really big in a resource rich country than one that we live in. But we're speaking to people in 100 countries around the world. And we've grown to the top 2% all because of great guests just like you. Maybe 30 second introduction. Uh, who are you and, and what, is, uh, what is Dakota Gold? Yeah, so Jonathan Odd, uh, present CEO, co-founder of Dakota Gold, which is uh, revitalizing the Homestake District in Leeds, South Dakota. And many people don't know this, but the Homestake Mine in, in Leeds, South Dakota was and still is America's largest single gold mine in its history. So over 40 million ounces of gold has you know was mined here from 1876 to 2001. And uh, we are revitalizing the district. We've made several discoveries. We came out with our first gold resource on April 30th on one of our projects. Everything we're doing is on private land, and we can maybe talk about that uh, later in the show. And I've spent over two decades financing small cap metals and mining. My last company was a company I was president, CEO, and co-founder of called Gold Standard Ventures. And we consolidated a land package in the Carlin Trend, which is a very prolific gold trend in Nevada. Made several discoveries, and it was bought by a bigger company called Orla Mining for about $300 million. My business partner and I, uh, Bob Quartermain, uh, started this company and merged with a public company that had a small land package in the Homestake District. And we've raised uh, about $120 million US to acquire this land, put the opportunity together and to and to explore and make these discoveries. I love it. So, you know, mining for gold or mining for, many, for anything is can be a challenge at times. There's so many things that are going on. But for people who are just starting out in this industry, maybe you can help them understand what are some things that they can do Number one, to get some early points on the board. And number two, what are some things they should not do or look out for to avoid blowing it all up in the beginning? What would you say? I think one thing that, that has served me well over the last two decades is, is investing in people. And, I, and I've said that repeatedly. You know, so people is really important to me. People who, who have experience, who are aligned. So people who are not aligned means they have none of their own money invested into their company. So I don't know how you can tell someone else to invest and it's so good, but yet it's not good enough for you to put your own money in. So that's something for me. That's one of those things I look for. You know, jurisdiction. There's a certain co- countries that I that I have no interest in being a, being an investor in or principal of, where rule of law does not apply. Typically, going to parts of the world that maybe have been seen as mature or have been overlooked. Uh, these are places that I like to go. And when I'm investing in the U.S., I try to do as much as I can on private ground, so you're not dealing with uh, the federal government because it triggers a different permitting process. Permitting and mining around the world is becoming is becoming a problem. And it's taking longer to get a permit, you know, from discovery of whatever metal you're looking for to production, you know, is now over 12 years. And you talked about, you know, mining and, you know, this whole decarbonization and and electrification of the world. Everyone, everyone wants that, but, you know, a lot of people don't want mining. And the only way we get to this electrification and essentially redo the grid and decarbonize is through safe and responsible mining. And I think the world is waking up and saying, wow, we underestimated how many hundreds of billions of dollars it will take or trillions in infrastructure, updating the grid to, to get to that, you know, carbon zero, net zero. Okay. And you mentioned people, um, what kind of things, so I, I'm assuming you're talking about like when you make an investment with an operator of a mine, that's what you're talking about. As far as people, you're talking about operators. I'm assuming you keep me honest. If that's the case. What kind of things do you look for when you look for good operators? I know you mentioned skin in the game. Is there anything else you can unpack that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, all commodities have, you know, have cycles. And I think 
anyone can make money in in a bull market when metal prices are going up or when you know the Dow or the S&P is going up. But it's what you do in bad times that I think defines and separates good management from great management. And I think when you look at my business partner, for example, you know he co-founded two companies, uh, Silver Standard in 1987. It had a market cap of 2.5 billion, or sorry, 2.5 million. And when he left the company in 2010, it was at 2.5 billion. He started a new company called Predium, went public with a, with a quarter billion dollar valuation, and it was sold for $3.5 billion to the world's third largest gold producer. And he did it for the second company called Predium from discovery to gold pour in under seven years. So those kinds of operators who are able to think in more than just one dimension, so he can think like a mining engineer, like a geologist, like a financier, strategist, people who have that ability and who've done it time and time again through up cycles and down cycles and everything in between. Hmm, brilliant. I think we all agree that, yeah, sure. When the market's doing good, I mean, if you're not making money, something's really bad, but most people can. But when those that timing or the market shifts, that's where I would say it really starts to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And so what do you look for? What advice can you give as far as what signals to look for, or at least information to look for, for those changes in uh, market cycles? Yeah. So I think I think when you, when you look at what's happening right now in the U.S. with the U.S. Federal Reserve at least you know this this rates higher rates for longer narratives certainly playing out and are they going to raise one more time before they start cutting you know if you, if you recall Q4 of last year they were pricing in seven rate cuts for this year uh, now it's one and it might be zero it could be one more rate hike and I think gold has inversely you know historically had an inverse relationship with the U.S. dollar so the U.S. dollar has been strong but I think as I was saying earlier I mean the Gold represents less than 1.5% of global assets. And there are very, very significant trends that are happening right now that no one is paying attention to. And that is, you know, for example, over the last two weeks, you know, this 50-year relationship that the U.S. has had with, with, with Saudi Arabia for the petrodollar, that's not happening anymore. And you're seeing this massive de-dollarization. Now, the U.S. dollar will still be the world's reserve currency for years to come. But every year, I think you'll see a gradual erosion away from that. And I think the fact that, that, we're, that we're having this discussion and gold is 2350, when the Fed does cut, whether it's Q4 or Q1 or Q2 of next year, I think that's where gold could go significantly higher. And then you will likely see money flow into the gold ETFs and trickle down into the gold equities. And I, th I think that's a really, really interesting time. And gold stocks from a historical basis have never been cheaper. That to me is really interesting. And that's the real value proposition for people who are looking at entering the space. So speaking of gold's never been cheaper, I really like that. Maybe we can unpack that because this can be a problem for people. We mentioned the second part of my question is, what are some of the things you can do to not lose? And I would say sometimes, whether it's gold investing or other investing, sometimes there's things that we call maybe a value trap or catching a falling knife. And so sometimes when you see on the outside, you're like, oh, it's such a good deal. The price is low. Maybe I should buy. How do you treat that as far as declining prices? Is it a value? Maybe. Is it not? Maybe. What advice can you speak to a beginner who's looking at this historically low price? What would you say? Look, I would say that fear is always a more powerful motivator than greed. And so people have a much easier time chasing stocks than they do, you know, averaging down or buying stocks. And sometimes there are liquidity events that happen. You know, a fund has a redemption, it has to sell and puts pressure on a stock or, you know, the Fed comes out with a surprise announcement and the gold price gets slammed down, you know, but I look at those things and I say, okay, have the fundamentals of the company changed? No. Okay. And I have an opportunity to buy a stock at a 20 or 30% discount. You know, I love that. That's fantastic. And during that period of time, are the insiders, are they buying or selling? You know, when, when insiders are, are selling consistently, that's obviously something to look for. But if insiders are buying and, and putting their own capital to work, uh, I think that speaks volumes to where the stock will ultimately go. I love that. To tack on to this, maybe you can walk through something. There's a little number I know you know. It's called ASIC. And maybe walk people through what is ASIC and how does that help with pricing and understanding whether you should get in to a deal or not? Yeah. So ASIC stands for all in sustaining cash costs or all in sustaining costs. And when you're looking at a gold producer, the lower the number, the better. So arguably, you know, or, or in my opinion, the best run and the best managed gold producing company in the world is Agnico Eagle. It trades both in Canada and in the US, and they are now the world's third largest gold producer and second largest gold producer by market cap. Uh, most of their assets are in Canada. They have assets in Australia, uh, Mexico, Finland. You know, their all-in standing costs are around eleven hundred dollars per ounce. So they've got a you know over fifty percent margin, and they're just really, really good operators, and they think long term. And when they commit to being in a in a mining camp or a jurisdiction, 
they have multiple operations feeding one central facility so they can realize economies of scale. They know the workforce. They know the government. They know the social issues that exist. You know, and then you've got higher cost uh, assets that, that require a higher you know, gold price environment to make any money. Those are typically, you know, in that sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. You're still making money, but not the kinds of margins that an Agnico Eagle would make. And then, if you want to look even further, a model that a lot of people like is the royalty model. So let's take Franco Nevada for example, which is uh, FNV in in New York or in Toronto, and they take a certain percentage off net mining, you know, sales, metal sales from a company's mine. So they don't actually have any operational risk. They have no commodity risk. They have no people risk. They just get a flat fee. So if, if a company has $100 million in revenue for, for a mine and they have a 2.5% you know, royalty on that, they get $2.5 million, regardless of what the gold price is, they get that off the top. Awesome. And so would you say that like 16, 1700 ASIC number is about a standard benchmark? And uh, like, how do you gauge over above the line, below the line? What, what's the line? I would say you want to be in that bottom quartile, which would be in that you know, anywhere from a thousand to like 13, 1400. So you have a lot of margin because the gold price, you know, historically can be volatile. You know, let's not forget here in 2001, 2002, the gold price was below $300 an ounce. Part of, you know, you know, the challenge is people look at this, this gold price environment, think these gold producers should be, you know, making billions of dollars. And some of them are, but the challenge is the cost to, to explore and develop and permit and mine and reclaim and the social issues and the government those costs have risen as fast or faster than the gold price itself. And COVID created a lot of supply chain issues, you know, labor issues, inflationary pressures. So it's, you know, these deposits are getting harder to find. A lot of the time, they're remote parts of the world that require massive investment investments into infrastructure. But once you get that first mine built and you have this sort of, you know, hub and spoke where you have, then you build your second one, your costs are lower because you already have the infrastructure. Then you build your third one, your costs are lower because you already have two and then you can get economies of scale. Some of these companies that have the ability to look out 10 years, 20 years, 30 years and how they sequence bringing on new mines, you know, that's great. And then as you come down the food chain, there are, you know, call it the the small to mid cap gold producers. Then there's the developers, guys who are are building mines. And then then there's the explore company, exploration companies that are looking to either make a discovery or move something from uh, discovery to a resource to development to production. Got it. You wouldn't have a show called Making Billions without talking about the market. So I'm just curious, uh, what are you seeing out there in the market now? What's what's going on uh, as far as gold and everything, all the headwinds, tailwinds? What do you see? I think this is an incredible time to be looking at this space. And you know, you've got 150 central banks around the world that are accumulating physical gold. So I think very interesting. So when when Russia invaded Ukraine, you know, the U.S. put all kinds of sanctions, seized a bunch of assets. So what the U.S. did is they gave the rest of the world a playbook that if you do something that's against U.S. foreign policy, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to say what Russia did was, 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 was right. So a lot of countries are saying we have, you know, our goals stored in your country. We want to take that back to our own country. So you can't expropriate that, you know. So you're, and, and China's doing that, and this, you know, formation of the BRICS. And there, I don't think there's going to be a currency because there's too many cultural and social issues. But there's, there's this desire to have an ability to settle transactions to something else other than US dollars. And I think gold is going to play a pivotal role. So I think you have gold price at 2350 and there still isn't a lot of interest in the gold equities. And I think that is this huge opportunity. Again, if you've got a view that in the next five years, the US dollar is lower than where it is today and that these deficits are becoming, you know, becoming a problem, they will be a problem at some point. You, know, you look at two and a half, three trillion a year in deficits, a trillion dollars on military and uh, a trillion dollars service your debt at some point that is unsustainable. And there's, so I, I love the position that, that the resource industry is in. And I think that when you look at, take the copper market, for example, so copper is, you know, the essential metal to electrify and decarbonize the world. Without copper, none of this works. Solar doesn't work. Wind doesn't work. EVs don't work. The largest copper mine in the world is called Escondida. It's in Chile and the world needs a new Escondida every year to meet demand. If you were to find, if you were to be so fortunate enough to find an Escondida from, from a, you know, discovery to production, 12 to 14 years. If you have a brownfields project, so a big copper resource, and you're looking to get it permitted and financed to production, seven to 10 years. So there's no pipeline. So I think, I, I think you will see materially higher metal prices in a lot of these uh, different commodities 
over the next five to 10 years. All right. So we, we got to, we got to get you into the, the asteroid mining here pretty soon. <laughs> you hear about all these commodities that's floating around in space. But in the meantime, you know, so I was just going to ask where you, what's your opinion on where the smart money is going? So it sounds like precious metals that's, that comes at no surprise or, or just metals in general. You know, and one of the things that you taught me um, when we spoke offline is there's about $6 trillion of cash or dry powder sitting on the sidelines. And uh, what do you believe is the catalyst that's going to unlock that? That, that six trillion. Yeah, so so I think when the Fed clearly pivots from you know raising rates to easing, I think you will see that money looking for more attractive returns. And depending on what kind of you know cutting cycle we we, we go into, you know, I think one of the you know executives that I follow, he's, he, he's not a mining guy, but Jamie Dimon, you know, CEO of J.P. Morgan, you know, a year ago he was talking about, look, I, I think rates are going to be higher for a lot longer. People should prepare for that. That they should have strategies in place to prepare for that. So. You know, but you're now coming to a situation where it's it's getting to a point where it's, you know, that this can can keep getting kicked down the road, but you keep raising the debt ceiling, you know, and you've got your your debt's thirty five trillion dollars. It's it's just it, it's not sustainable. So I, I think that money is gonna want to go and 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 chase the hot sector. So, you know, AI, you know, it's a big one, but the whole I think you'll see another leg up in, in the whole EV battery metals, again, anything to do with the electrification, green energy, decarbonization, that's gonna catch a bit all day long. Perfect. So as we round third base, I'm just curious, you know, let, let's give some people the competitive edge, some of the, some of the, the secret sauce, maybe two or three pieces of competitive advantage that you can provide to people. If they're saying, I love what you do. I love everything you're talking about. How do I become you in a quarter of the time? What would you tell them? Well, there, there, there's a there's a famous investor, uh, resource investor in the mining industry, and his name is Rick Rule. And he's he's had a, you know, I think a five decade career. And, and he will talk about if I just invested in six people and he calls those people the, you know, six mining legends, living legends, I would be infinitely wealthier than I am today. And he's already a very wealthy man. So again, I, I keep coming back to, you know, people uh, who, who have a track record, uh, who have alignment with their shareholders, who put the shareholder first, who can articulate their strategy and what they're trying to do. I think if you invest in good people, you will save a lot of capital and a lot of headaches. And, and I think so, so that for me is a big one. You know, we talked about jurisdiction, location, there are certain, you know, countries that I have no interest in, in being an investor in or a principal of because it's just too hard to take on social risk or permitting risk or when the government can say, you know what, we want a bigger piece of the asset or we want the asset. And I've had friends who have been in those situations and it's horrible. You know, you, you, you can lose five, 10 years of your life and all of your money. Okay. And, and so finding good operators, working with them. And we talked about some of the things that you look for early on in the show. We talked about things you look for is finding operators. What else would you say uh, could really accelerate people in as far as being an expert investor in this space? Again, during periods of extreme pessimism, where you, you essentially have that for a lot of the mining equities and where there's just not money flowing in. And I think now that's why now is an excellent time to be, to be looking and you've got this massive disconnect, this bifurcation where you've got strong metal prices and you know somewhat weaker equities. When you look at relative on a relative value basis, where gold is, looking at where where it has been historically. So, so I think just again understanding kind of cycles and, and and fund flows, and again just looking at so when the Fed starts to pivot, in the market will typically front run that. So at some point in the next year, you likely will have a Fed pivot to an easing cycle. Another interesting thing that I find, you know, just fascinating is that the world's two biggest economies are doing opposite things with interest rates. One's cutting and one's hiking. So I find that super interesting. So I think I think the longer rates stay higher in the U.S., ultimately the higher gold is going to go. That's my that's that's my strong strong conviction and strong belief. Now there might be a lag of money coming into the ETFs, and that's really where you will see some of these equities materially higher than where they are today. Yeah. Okay. Love it. So uh, as we wrap things up, is there anything else you'd like our fans to know? Any th- how to reach out to you or anything at all? Yeah. So we've got a great website. That's a phenomenal resource for, for what we're doing and who we are. And it's and it's dakotagoldcorp.com. We have a, li- a, a LinkedIn page where we post a lot of things. We're, we're very active in, in our community, in Leeds, in, in, in South Dakota. Those two pages are great. You know, look, my, my email address is jodd at dakotagoldcorp.com. So J-A-W-D-E at dakotagoldcorp.com. We are the kind of company that I don't care if you own 100 shares or a million shares, you're an investor. You've taken the time and you've taken your own capital and you have many places to put that capital and you've chosen to put it with us. I'll give you all the time you want because without investors, you know this concept that, that started from a flight down to South Dakota and looking at 
wow, this is this is the most significant gold mine in the history of America. And we have an opportunity to do these deals with Barrick Gold out of their closure group. Because when Barrick came in and bought Homestake, it wasn't for South Dakota. It was for other assets they had in their in their global portfolio. And we bought it out of you know Barrick's closure group and then grew the 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 opportunity from five thousand acres to fifty thousand acres. So we are aligned with shareholders. I mean, my, my business partner and the co-chair, Bob Quartermain, doesn't take any salary. He works for free and he's the biggest shareholder. So he's super aligned with all of our investors. Our other co-chair, Steve O'Rourke, he ran global exploration for petroleum for BHP. So this is a guy that, that had multi-billion dollar budgets every year. So we've got people who have taken assets from, from discovery to development to production and who have a lot of skin in the game. You know, Between Bob Quartermain and I, we have almost $10 million of our own money into the deal. Brilliant. So just to summarize everything that we talked about, so find excellent operators to invest alongside of them. That is one of the keys that Jonathan's talking about. The other thing that you mentioned, Jonathan, is look for metals, uh, the value of those metals and how it compares to the value of equity and use that as a position, kind of a, a launch pad, if you, if you will. And then finally, one of the last things that we mentioned was seek operations with an ASIC around a thousand an ounce or better. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions.